Hello once again and welcome to another edition of the SaskGangToday.com Roundtable. I'm your host, GX94 Yorkton Agriculture Director, Doug Falconer, joined by 620 CKRM Agri-News Director, Ryan Young, and the Chief Agricultural Editor for SaskGangToday.com, Evan Hirsch. And uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi, Doug. Good afternoon. We'll maybe start off first with canola and uh, Canola actually closed be below $600 per metric ton on Friday. Uh, what's uh, the latest that Adam Piccolo said on that, Ryan? Uh, well, it was uh, not really surprising that it was uh, going down, and Adam hated to be the bearer of bad news, as he put it, but unfortunately, that's just where the things are going. Uh, in terms of you know why it's happening, he pointed again to uh, the weather that's happening in Argentina and Brazil, uh, weather in Argentina doing kind of an about face with, uh, you know, some rains over to some hot weather, uh, that may not be boding well for, uh, the soybean market and all that. Uh, he was kind of looking at this point to see if, uh, if it's going to go down to as low as maybe $550, he wouldn't be surprised by that, but, you know, kind of at this point, if it gets to $600 or hopefully a little more than that, you know, it's a start. So those are kind of the reasons he pointed to as to why canola is uh, where it's going down at this point. And I know, Kevin, uh, with canola being down, we've kind of mentioned it over the last few episodes that it's kind of volatile and just shows no signs of slowing down. Yeah, now and then it's seen brief partial recoveries, but it's really been on a downhill slope ever since uh, ever since harvest if memory serves, I could have sold canola at harvest uh, well above $17 a bushel, and now it's it's scarcely above $13 a bushel. I remember when it was about 15 or 16, there was analysts saying, "Oh, don't don't sell at this price; it's going to get better." Well, it's it's got progressively worse. Uh, export demand is really soft. China isn't buying nearly as much canola as they were. The world supply demand situation, many other commodities also dropping. So. There's a lot of unpriced, unsold canola in Canada. Uh, the the loss, uh, of course, it isn't a loss, I guess, till you sell it. But sometime you're going to have to sell it. The loss, if you were to sell now for many producers, you would add up to billions of dollars in Western Canada. That's too bad. And, of course, Bill C-234 made news again this week in Ottawa. It's actually being discussed again in the House of Commons, Ryan. That's right. And it's actually kind of a surprise because everybody thought it was going to be at the bottom of the pile, but it turns out it got to the top of the pile somehow. And Ben Loeb making his plea to his colleagues in the House of Commons to reject the amendments on Bill C-234, which is the reduction of the sunset clause to three years from eight and the removal of the exemption for natural gas use for heating and cooling barns and greenhouses. Um, I also spoke to Todd Lewis, uh, staying on the topic uh, about Bill C-234, and he kind of added his voice to many other agricultural groups over the past few months, saying that this bill needs to get past the finish line and be passed in its original form. He's got some confidence that it will go up eventually, but it remains to be seen as to uh, whether that's actually going to happen in the House. I've heard that uh, support as far as parties are concerned, might not be the same as it once was before, uh, especially from the Bloc and the NDP, but you never know in politics, anything can happen. Kevin? Yeah, it's, it is an interesting one to watch. And segueing to a, another topic that, you know, where things actually have worked in the House of Commons, I was at the Crossroads Crop Conference in Calgary this week, and one of the speakers was Carlo Dade of the Canada West Foundation. And I, I knew this bill was proceeding through the House of Commons, uh, but Canada West Foundation had helped it along. It was called, it was all to do with machine and equipment interoperability. In other words, it, 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 the one that comes to mind, although it could affect many short line equipment manufacturers, is Macdon Industries in Winnipeg and Honeybee Manufacturing in Frontier, Saskatchewan, both of which build headers for combines and swathers. Well, one one uh, combine company, Maidenline Combine Company, their newest combine, uh, has digital locks. You can't put a short line uh, uh, equipment header on there. 
actually this is something where the system actually worked and all of the parties agreed to the, the, the private member's bill to push this forward, say, no, that's wrong. There should be allowances made so that short line equipment can fit on mainline equipment uh, and, and operate properly. No digital lock, no, excuse me, no digital locks. And this actually passed the House of Commons is in third reading in the Senate. And because it hasn't been controversial, we haven't actually heard very much about it, but a, a very interesting piece of legislation and, and proof that maybe uh, what happens in Ottawa is, is not all the fighting that we typically talk about. And it sounds like there's a similar law already in place in the United States. Yes, they, they seem to have solved this uh, copyright issue uh, ahead of us, but it, it received unanimous uh, support in the, in the House of Commons before moving on to the Senate. And Carlo Dade's point was that, you know, we should keep nudging this along and, and producers should be aware of it when they talk to their MPs and whether they're in opposition or in government to, to keep this nudged along so that it, it, it gets passed in a timely fashion and becomes law. Another speaker at that Crossroads Crop Conference that you uh... Had to listen to was Drew Lerner, of course, very well known from World Weather Inc. And actually, it sounded like uh, 2024 might not be shaping up to be too bad of a year, uh, moisture-wise. That's uh, that's Drew's hope. And when he's looking for uh, comparable years based on all the patterns we've seen, one of his choices was 1988, which would be a, a complete disaster. That was a terrible drought year in Saskatchewan. But he's, he's looked at it uh, from numerous different ways, uh, charts and graphs and maps. So he's, he's calling his prediction for the spring is that it's going to continue to be drier in, than normal in much of Alberta and some of western Saskatchewan. A uh, little bit of a wet pattern in the spring in southern Manitoba. By summer, he's calling for a lot of areas to be near normal precipitation. Uh, the dryness will actually start happening in southern Manitoba and some of southeast Saskatchewan, whereas there will be a, a much wetter than normal clump in about between North Battleford and Edmonton. Now, all of these are, are very preliminary, but he does have hope that we might not be facing, especially due, the, due through the summer period, the major uh, water shortfall that we've seen uh, in, in 2023 and before that in 2021. It almost sounds like uh, he's saying that uh, weather this year is going to look similar to 2006 based on some 18-year uh, trends. Yeah, that and jet stream analysis and how the weather looks. So I, I'd sure take that over a, over a 1988. And one thing I found very interesting is we talk about how the, the big spike in temperature that we saw worldwide in 2023 and a lot of people saying, oh, we'll see what climate change and carbon dioxide is doing to us. And he said it's, it's really the huge volcanic eruption that occurred in the middle of the Pacific back in January of 2022, the largest in recent history, bigger than Mount Pinatubo and, and bigger than Mount St. Helens, but it was underwater and put a vast amount of water vapor into the atmosphere. Didn't receive a lot of attention. But he says uh, that's his belief as to why 2023 was such a huge spike in temperatures when you graph it on a worldwide basis. Another uh, event that came up from 2023 was the uh, Saskatchewan Pea Leaf Weevil Survey. It was released this week, and I had a chance to speak with uh, James Tanzi with uh, Saskatchewan Agriculture on that, and of course, he released a survey map for that, and it showed that uh, northern Saskatchewan and eastern Saskatchewan were the ones that had the highest levels of pea leaf weevils. And obviously, the, the situation perhaps uh, are, is it could happen again this year, but definitely it was that area north of Yorkton, between Yorkton and Hudson Bay, and over towards the Battlefords, where the pea leaf weevil uh, really saw uh, some large numbers in 2023. And uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, I guess that's where a lot of the pulse crops are growing, right, Kevin? Uh, yeah, it's, I'd have to look at the distribution map for, for peas. Um, you know, sometimes when you get up into those more uh, central and northern grain belt areas, people sometimes shy away from peas because you can have other disease issues in them. So I'd have to, I have a map of that. If you ever would look at the, uh, the, uh, the special crops publication put out here by SaskAg, 
you can take whether it's lentils or peas or chickpeas or mustard and see the distribution across the province. But uh, there's probably lots of peas there, but I don't think it would actually be the heaviest concentration. But certainly a pea leaf weevil is something that they should be looking out for based on that map. Yeah, you said it was moving from Manitoba westward. So I guess that's why this area here around the Yorkton area, there's been some numbers and, and even up, up towards the Battleford. So it's kind of interesting to keep an eye on. And uh, Ryan, of course, the Canada Saskatchewan feed program was announced uh, this week that there's been, I guess, an extension to it. You had a chance to speak with the, the president and CEO of the Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporation, Jeff Morrow, on that. That's right. And for those that don't know, the two updates that were made, uh, the extension, there's been an extension to the application deadline for those that maybe are still taking inventory of their feed or maybe considering uh, applying. It's been extended to March 15th. The original date was March, March 1st. So an extra couple of weeks there. So that's good. And then the other uh, update um, was to 10 additional RMs, uh, additional RMs coverage into the coverage area. Uh, seven of those RMs are around the Regina area. There's a couple of northeast of Saskatoon, and then there's one north of Lloyd Minster on the Saskatchewan side. Um, but Jeff Morrow says he encourages farmers to apply anyway, especially if they're in areas that either border the coverage area or if they're not in the coverage area regardless. So those would be areas like around Winyard or Humboldt, Prince Albert, Meadow Lake. Um, so again, if if you're not in the coverage area, but you know it might be a rare instance where you had a dry year, it doesn't hurt to apply anyway and see where that goes because you never know. In terms of the interview itself, a uh, little bit disappointing. You know, he's by the book and that's understandable. But a couple of things I was kind of looking out for so far was uh, just how the applications were going, how many were by region, and how many were by uh, specific livestock. There's many different livestock that's eligible under the program, uh, including but not limited to bison, uh, beef cattle, deer, goats, etc. Uh, unfortunately, those statistics and numbers were unavailable, according to him. But he did say that at this point, since the announcement last August, there was over a thousand applications to the program, much of them being on the beef side. Here's, here's my theory about this, and, and Alberta did something very similar, extended the area, extended the deadline. I think because there's requirements to show that you've incurred extra costs and there's extra paperwork involved, I don't think they're getting the number of applications or committing nearly as much money as they thought. And that's why I think they keep expanding the area and expanding the deadlines is that they, they're not going to reach their, their spending limits. So, now, that's a hunch on my part. I haven't heard that officially but that would be my guess yeah not enough money that's what two billion dollars that was available i believe it was no no it was no it was in the it was in the the 70 million or something in saskatchewan i can't remember the number exactly the two yeah. billion was uh, what crop insurance cost in 2023 but the the agri recovery portion i'd have to look that number up again as to exactly what the allocation was in saskatchewan shared federally and provincially yeah, now that I think about it, it's about 70 and 70 million between the federal and provincial governments. The 2 billion, I was thinking of another statistic. Yeah. All right. And of course, uh, Do More Ag Foundation is, uh, I guess, offering some grant money and that sort of thing. And Ryan, you had a chance to speak with Megs Reynolds, the executive director of Do More Ag. Yeah. So this is the fifth year of the community fund put on by Do More Agriculture and Farm Credit Canada. Um, this particular fund, from what I understand, it's not really your typical fund where you send in an application and you get an X amount of money based on criteria that you follow. It seems like it's a, a fund that when you apply and get approved, you get access to different mental health support programs, whether that's peer to peer or maybe a in-person workshop that comes to your community. Uh, it's open to rural communities across Canada, by the way. So that seems to be what the community fund is all about. So far, the intake has been pretty good. They've managed to cover every single province uh, in terms of applications, including here in Saskatchewan, where it got its start. So a pretty good start there. Uh, the application process uh, opened uh, January 18th, and it's on until February 15th. So still a little bit of time, about a couple of weeks to apply. 
And uh, yeah, it's been been pretty good so far. Yeah, Kevin, I guess mental health has always been an issue for, for farmers, but we're hearing a lot more about it over the last five years. I, I think farmers are in, in many ways where, yes, it's a stressful industry, but we certainly have some, some organizations like Do More Ag and uh, a, a lot of others that, it's, that, that sponsor organizations such as that. You know, there is a, a farm stress line that producers can call if they're, they're feeling they're in, in difficulty and get, get counseling. So in many respects, I think uh, the agriculture sector is, is lucky that uh, organizations and people have realized there's a need and, and there are resources available. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this week for the SaskAngToday.com Roundtable. On behalf of Chief Agricultural Editor Kevin Hirsch and 620 CKRM Regina Agri-News Director Ryan Young, I'm GX94 Agriculture Director Doug Faulkner saying so long until next week.